Welcome to Missing in Ohio, a podcast devoted to telling the stories of Ohio's missing loved ones. I am your host, Kelly Hammonds, and this is Chapter 6, The Disappearance of Joshua Wright. Joshua Wright, a.k.a. Gouda Montana, is a missing adult from Cincinnati, Ohio. Joshua was last seen on February 3, 2018. The red GMC truck he was driving was later found abandoned with bullet holes in it. There has been little communication between law enforcement and the family, leaving the family feeling as if nothing is being done to locate Josh. Today I will be joined by Kenny Wright, Josh's brother. Okay, Kenny, let's start by you telling us a little bit about Joshua. Well, he's a good father of three. He, he enjoys family life. He loved his family. He worked with my father in a machine shop. He enjoyed it. Leading up to Joshua's disappearance, did his life appear to be normal? Yes, ma'am, it was. He had left my house the Friday that he had disappeared at 4.30. Happy have to go lucky. Mood was good. Attitude was great. Tell me about the day Joshua disappeared and the things he did. I did talk to him. 4.30 when he left my house, and about 5.30 was the last time I ever talked to him. And my father talked to him around 9 o'clock that night. How did your family find out Joshua was missing? His, some friends of his that got a phone call, they said Sunday night, stating that Josh was dead and he would not find his body. They come to the house, they come to my father's house, I'm sorry, man, and told my father this. I was there as well. And when did your family begin looking for Joshua? We had suspected something because we were looking for him Saturday. But that was the phone call that actually came through stating he was dead and we would not find his body. When did your family decide to report Josh missing to law enforcement? Yes, there is a missing persons report filed. The 4th or 5th of February, it was filed. Filed right after the time they come and told us that he was dead. Was it completely abnormal for Josh to not communicate with family and friends? Ma'am, I mean, I'm going to tell you something, and you're going to say, okay, it's this family member missing. He's probably blowing smoke. But, ma'am, I talk to each one of my family members three times a day. And all of us live within three miles of each other. He said for one sister we have in Oklahoma. But other than that, we're all within a handful of miles of each other. Okay. We do communicate very much. That's why we were looking for him Saturday before we even got the phone call. Shortly after Joshua went missing, his truck was located. When was it located? Tuesday on Forges, we found the truck that he was driving when he left my house. It was my father's truck. Tell me about the area where the truck was located. It was basically a vacant house. Okay. And the only reason I was in there, the doors was already kicked in, so I just ran in there real quick and looked around to see if my brother was in there. Tell me about the condition of the truck when it was located. There was a hole in the driver's side door. It was like a bullet hole. There was a hole. There was what could be ricochets off of the, uh, like the ground hitting the truck. Mm-hmm. And there's another hole in the front of the truck. And the day they found the truck, we when we called the detectives and the police down there, they sent the detectives. It was, it was it had snowed the night before that. And there was still snow on the truck. There was no footprints around the truck and was whatsoever. From our previous conversation, I know that the police had his truck processing it for evidence for close to three months. Tell me about the condition when the truck was returned and what you found. They had it that long before we got it back from them. When it come back in the back bed of the truck, there was two spent 9mm shells back there. For the police not to find the bullet casings, that's a pretty big deal to me. Does it appear that any other testing was done on the truck? It does not appear to have any. No, ma'am, it does not. There's no dust in it where they fingerprint it. There's the the truck was a mess when we got it back. They had it for two and a half, three months. 
And what did you do with the shell casings? I took them back down their tools, personally. Took them down the CIS unit. Besides the cell phone, was there anything that went missing with Joshua? It's missing with him and it's missing with his truck keys and his house key. Tell me about some of the searches that were conducted by either your family or law enforcement. The police stated they did a search of 10 acres back there. But later, come to find out, I'm not saying they did not do that search. But they also said they searched Bowling Green and Moosewood. Well, when we called and asked them about the, the canines going there, well, it's a wooded area because the family has been back there themselves looking for them. It is a wooded area, and he told us they deemed it unsafe for the dogs to go back there. Okay, the wooded area they claim to check 10 acres of is every bit as bad as that area. So I believe in they got the dogs out, walked them where they could walk them, and that was it. But I have been in that woods, and I have been in the house that they found the truck at parked in the driveway. Let's go back and talk about the phone call that Joshua's friends received. They stated Joshua is dead and his body would never be found. Were police able to determine who called? Ma'am, I'm getting very little answers from the police. They basically tell us we got to prove he's missing first. The uh, phone call is not enough to arouse suspicion is what I'm getting at. You know, I don't know how you could overlook a phone call like that. Do you know why they would choose to call the people they did? That's what we can't understand. How do they know to contact the people they contacted? We do, we're, not, we're not getting this no one whatsoever. Everybody's got, it's all blocked numbers. Have you been able to determine who Joshua was with that night? I've heard he was with several people that night, but I can't get nothing substantiated. There's nothing that we can get a good lead on to even follow up on. We've heard stories everywhere. From, this is people talking in the streets. We've heard stories that he was chopped up in pieces. We heard stories he was burnt. We heard stories he was weighted down and thrown in the river. We heard stories he could be anywhere from our backyard, basically, to California. The only story we've got is main, is remain consistent is the fact that he is dead. The other stories will send you on a search here, a search 20 miles in the opposite direction, where he, where the people say he said, I heard that he was supposed to be. Well, they dumped him at. They were doing all that construction work on Queen City when he disappeared. And we've even heard he was buried in a hole there, and now it's covered up with 10 or 15 feet of concrete. We heard all kinds of stuff. Are there any of Joshua's friends that still participate in searches or communicate with your family? A handful of them are, yes. A handful of them go with us to look for him. When we have searches, we go search certain areas we hear about. And these stories you keep hearing about what happened to Joshua, they're just hearsay, right? Like word on the street? Yeah. It's like someone will hear someone talking about something and private messenger or leave a note here or do something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's nothing you can substantiate. It's nothing you can even back track to to have the detectives go talk to them about because they never leave names. You think you get in your head to where you believe it's a wild goose chase. But if you can physically check it yourself, you can at least get that out the way. And maybe it's a one time it's not a wild goose chase. You can confirm that you went there. What do you think happened to Joshua? We believe he was set up and killed. This is the only thing we can, I can honestly tell you, I truly believe that he was set up by someone close and killed. As far as the theories, to be honest with you, there's a couple dozen of them out there, and I really can't, in my mind, can't be known fit. Don't get me wrong, I'm out of the taper. But things you know about him, and you know he wouldn't do this certain aspect to have to put himself in that situation. You see what I'm getting at? It's just elimination by knowing him. 
you know, he wouldn't do this stupid thing here or be this out there hanging out and going to clubs with people. He wouldn't do this stupid thing to put himself in that position. My brother likes to hang out. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying nothing bad about him. And I'm not putting him on a pedestal of anything. He likes to go out and hang out. So we worry about him, to be honest with you. So if he's out late night, we try to get in contact with him, make sure he's all right before we lay down and go to bed. What do you and your family think needs to be done to get answers for Joshua? Ma'am, I am so overwhelmed, I have no idea. They don't seem like they're taking it any seriously whatsoever. They don't return phone calls a week or two later. We had a group that was going to come back and help us search that wooded area I was talking about. Mm-hmm. And they won't even go as far as giving them, hey, this is the place he could be. It is a dangerous area. Cops don't go in there. They let the gentleman lay down there two hours after he'd been shot because the officer said he was too scared to get out of his car. That was actually on the news. He had actually called off backup. The same area is where my brother was supposed to have been shot and killed at. Would Joshua have any reason to be in the area? I do honestly believe he was seeing some girl down there. Have there been any sightings of Joshua? We, if there is, man, we have heard nothing about him, no. So I'm going to say no. Okay. There is no one privately contacted us because we, we think we've seen him here or we think we've seen him there. Any private contact we get from anybody of any sort is telling us he is there. Do you have a Facebook page for Joshua or a way for people to contact you about Joshua's disappearance? See, I never had Facebook before this. And I only opened it up so if people had information, they could contact me. Because that's the mainstream of social media, so to speak. I had one in my name as Kenny Spike, but I got to sit up in case friends and one of his friends hear something and want to contact me privately. I'm just making every route available to them to open up and contact me. And it could be done privately, it could be done in person, it could be done however they want to. I'm just trying to give them every avenue to contact me. At the time of my phone call with Kenny, the family did not have a Facebook page devoted to Josh. After our conversation, I helped them set one up. The page is called Help Find Joshua Wright, a.k.a. Gouda, Montana. Please visit the page and share Joshua's picture to help raise awareness for the Wright family. I would like to thank Kenny and the entire Wright family for taking the time to speak with me and allowing me to tell Joshua's story. And now here is my summary and opinions on the disappearance of Joshua Wright. Joshua Wright is a father of three that came from a tight-knit family where it was normal to speak multiple times a day. On the day he went missing, he had last seen his brother at 4.30 p.m., but he spoke to him on the phone at 5.30 p.m. At 9 p.m., Joshua called his dad from his friend's phone because Josh's phone had died. Around 12 a.m., Josh's brother decided to call his phone but didn't get an answer. We know very few factual details about Josh's activities of the night or who he was with. Even before the family knew Joshua was missing, they knew something was off when they didn't hear from him on Saturday. Their suspicions were confirmed when Joshua's friends got in contact with his family about a phone call they had received on Sunday. An anonymous caller called a friend of Josh's stating Josh had been killed and that his body would never be located. Why this person selected to call Josh's friends leads me to believe the caller was definitely connected to Josh. With the call coming in before anyone even realized Joshua was missing, tells me that there is a little truth to the things that they said. When Joshua went missing, his keys, cell phone, and truck went missing as well. On Tuesday, Joshua's truck was located at an abandoned house. The truck was found with bullet holes in multiple places. The day before Josh's truck was discovered, a snowstorm moved through, covering any footprints or other evidence that may have been left behind. Law enforcement took the truck into evidence for processing and had it for almost three months. When the family received the truck back, it was a mess. 
Things were thrown around in the truck, making the family believe that the police didn't actually process the truck. Their suspicions were confirmed when Joshua's brother found two 9mm shell casings in the bed of Josh's truck. How this was missed by law enforcement is beyond me. Josh's brother took the casings to the police, but got no answers on why they are still in the truck. As a matter of fact, police have given very little information or cooperation to the family, not even showing up at any searches or vigils hosted by Josh's family. The area where Josh's truck was located was a very rough, crime-ridden neighborhood. It was so bad, in fact, that when a shooting in the area was called in to the police, the officer literally let the deceased victim lay on the ground for close to two hours due to the fear of getting out of his car. Joshua's family has been doing everything in their power to find answers to the questions they have. One thing they would like answers to is Joshua's cell phone usage. It is firmly believed that Joshua's phone was used after the time the family believes he was set up and murdered. At 1.20 a.m., Joshua's phone pinged around the area of Jack's Casino, but there is no evidence that Joshua was actually there. I am in agreement with the family that I believe Joshua was a victim of foul play. I also believe that the person or persons that caused harm to Josh was someone that he knew. It's the only thing that makes sense to me with his friends receiving the phone call stating Josh is dead. I also feel there is more than one person involved. Joshua was not a little guy. He was close to six feet tall and 245 pounds. One person is not going to move his body by themselves. Joshua's family has done many searches and they would like to plan another one with a group of volunteers. If you are in the Cincinnati area and would like to volunteer to help with the search, you can contact Missing in Ohio, or you can contact Joshua's family on the Help Find Joshua Wright, a.k.a. Gouda Montana, Facebook page. You can also follow Joshua's disappearance on the Facebook page. Joshua Wright is a missing adult from Cincinnati, Ohio. He was last seen on February 3, 2018. Joshua was 30 years old at the time of his disappearance and would be 31 years old today. Joshua is a biracial male, approximately 5 foot 10 inches tall and 245 pounds. He is bald with brown eyes. Joshua has several distinguishing tattoos, such as teardrops under each eye, heartless on his neck, a pyramid with an eye in the center of his forehead, a large skull on his right shoulder, a large cross on his back, rest in peace Tristan on his left hand, death before dishonor on his right hand, money over everything on his chest, and the names Jada, Josh, and Josiah. If you have any information on the disappearance of Joshua Wright, please contact the Cincinnati Police Department at 513-263-8121. Missing in Ohio is an affiliate of Missing Person from Ohio. Missing Person from Ohio is a Facebook page ran by Lori Davis devoted to raising awareness for Ohio's missing loved ones. And now here's a news update from Lori. Hi, this is Lori from Missing Person from Ohio Facebook page. I wanted to provide a few updates on some missing person cases. Um, one, I want to talk about Sean Antill. He's a 24-year-old that has been missing since December 23rd, 2017. So. It's now been over nine months. Um, Sean's case is a little um, different than most. He was um, seen exiting a vehicle um, along US 250 in Harrison County. Um, it's kind of an odd case, so I'm hoping that the answers can come in his case. His family is very persistent, and I'm proud of what they do to keep his name out there. So I just wanted to mention his case. Again, it's Sean Antill. 24 years old. He was 5'3", 120 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes. Um, and he's been missing long enough. So if you have any information on his case, you can contact the Harrison County Sheriff's Office at 740-942-2197. Um, another case that I want to talk about that doesn't get a lot of publicity, but he's now been missing over six months. And his name is Aaron. He goes by the name of Scott and the last name is Davis. Um, he's 43 years old. He's a white male, 6'1", 185, blonde hair, blue eyes. He does have some tattoos that would help to um, identify him. One is a, in the front of his neck, he has Samantha, and then across his knuckles, he has Hopeless. 
Um, he was actually seen on April the 8th of 2018 in Springfield Township. Um, Springfield Township Police is who you would need to contact at 330-784-1609. I also wanted to mention a couple of um, interesting updates that happened on um, both in Michigan and in Ohio. Um, there was one arrest where five individuals were arrested and they ended up being charged with over 100 charges related to human trafficking. What I found, was, that was amazing in itself, um, but the, another additional thing that I thought was very interesting was that three of those that were arrested um, were over the age of 70 years old. That was very alarming and um, kind of eye-opening for me because I guess I don't normally look at someone over the age of 70 and, and even think that human trafficking may be involved. Um, so that's an interesting one. There was also a case um, in Michigan. They did what was called a missing kid sweep. They had multiple law enforcement agencies, um, the U.S. Marshals, the FBI, um, Michigan State Police, et cetera, and they came together in one day, and this is amazing what they're reporting. They're saying that 123 children were found um, that were missing during that one-day sweep. I haven't read a, a lot of the details on that, but it, it's just very intriguing to me. I'd like to learn more about that, and um, if we can do that in one day, uh, I just I wish that 123 hadn't been missing for any period of time, I guess. Um, so I don't know, very intriguing for me, and I'll, I'll be watching that. Another update on a case that's pretty popular is Jacob Caldwell. Um, he was the boy that witnessed his father's murder. He was missing for over a year. They found him recently, and an update was just released in the news that he um, will be sent to a mental health facility. So I'm truly praying that he can get there and that they, he can get the help that he needs. He's had so many traumatic events in his short life, and um, I hope that some of the emotional help that he needs um, can be provided at that mental health facility. Um, two other cases I want to mention quickly. One is a 26-year-old. Um, she went missing from Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, she told her family that she would be right back. She left. Her family is not sure if she got in a vehicle or if she left on foot. She was last seen on Saturday, October the 6th. Her name is Rebecca. She goes by the name of Becky Kearns. And again, that's Portsmouth, Ohio. She's 5'2", 145 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes. The um, Portsmouth Police Department at 740-353-4101 is who is handling her case. Um, one thing that I really am, am happy to see is that we published her flyer 22 hours ago and she has already received or reached 20,188 people. Um, she's been shared 663 times. So this that goes to show the power of social media and those numbers always make me smile when I can um, see that the person's face is, gonna, is getting out there and maybe without that post, maybe they wouldn't have got out there as much as what they did. So it always gives me a little bit of incentive to continue going forward. Um, and the last case I want to mention today, it's Cheryl, and I believe the last name is pronounced Coker. Um, she's a 46-year-old. She's missing from Riverside, Ohio. She um, was last seen dropping her daughter off at school. Um, there are some reports that she was seen on video, that the, her car is seen on video, but they're not saying um, they couldn't see her, I guess. They don't know who got out of the driver's seat. Her case is, is a worrisome one. Um, they're not really sure what happened to her. She's a mother. She was dependable, and all of a sudden she just disappeared. She had filed for divorce 11 days prior to her disappearance. I am not saying um, that the husband's a suspect in any way, um, but that's always just a little bit worrisome when you see something or hear something like that. So um, if you can please keep her in your thoughts and Hopefully, they can get some good news and we can get her home. But when her car was found, her possessions were also found in the car, including the cell phone and the purse. So again, that, that always is just a little bit worrisome, and um, I, I hope that Cheryl can get home safely. Um, if you have any information on her case, you can contact Detective Abney at 
233-1801, extension 828. Thanks so much for caring about the missing. Thanks for listening to the Missing in Ohio podcast. Thanks for listening to our updates and also following both Missing in Ohio and Missing Person from Ohio. We appreciate it very much, and we hope and pray every day that it does help lead the missing home. If you have a missing loved one and would like us to help you tell their story, please contact us at missingpersonsinohio at gmail.com or you can use Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All of the links can be found in the show notes. You can find Missing in Ohio on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, and many of the other listening platforms you enjoy. Follow us on Facebook and remember to join our group page to discuss all the cases that you hear on Missing in Ohio. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You can email us at missingpersonsinohio at gmail.com. If you like this podcast and would like to help us raise awareness, please give us five stars and leave a review on whatever platform you enjoy. As many of you know, I am one of the hosts of Comeback, a podcast devoted to the disappearance of Brian Schaefer. In two weeks, I will be doing Chapter 7, The Disappearance of Brian Schaefer. The episode will be a little different as I will not be interviewing a family member. Instead, I will be doing a roundtable discussion with many people involved in Brian's case. You will hear many things that you may have heard before, but we also have brand new information to release. So make sure you tune in next time for the disappearance of Brian Schaefer. Thank you for listening to Missing in Ohio, Chapter 6, The Disappearance of Joshua Wright. Tune in in two weeks for Chapter 7, The Disappearance of Brian Schaefer.